Okay, we're back live inside the Cube in Orlando, Florida for IBM Edge 2012. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com and the Cube, and we're here to extract the signal from the noise and share with you uh, what's happening here at the event, and uh, I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and we're here with Steve Watavich, uh, who is the Vice President of Storage Software Development at IBM. And now John, Apple had the Waz, all right, IBM has the the Woj. That's exactly right, <laughs> Woj. Woj, long O. Hey, Woj. you know his uh, Twitter account? Steve underscore W-O-Z. Mine's Steve underscore W-O-J. All right. There you go. So follow him. Welcome to theCUBE, Steve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Vice President of Stor Storage to Software. Tivoli. Tivoli, Tivoli, Tivoli right. Software. Um, so you build the products that all those guys say, we got to make this. Um, we were talking before you came on about some of the challenges. So first tell us what you see as the landscape around the environment around storage. Obviously storage is an enabler, there's a lot of stuff going on around it. Uh, Ed was talking about the portfolio. Uh, IBM has a lot of different groups outside of storage, you guys got to work together. Talk about right. how that's playing in and how software sits with the hardware and all that, all that good well, stuff. Well, so, so from an IBM perspective, we build software to optimize the IBM storage components, obviously. Uh, we also build uh, management and protection capabilities for any hardware platform. So, you know, being able to do management across whatever vendor you choose as a hardware platform uh, allows you to, you know, optimize and, and build capabilities and, and do management as well as protect the data on it. At the end of the day, it's about information. Yeah? And so, putting the bits on storage devices, managing the bits across those storage devices, and being able to protect those bits for retention purposes, whether it's compliance, so, uh, business process, So we, we were talking, you had a very simple philosophy around storage. So share with the folks out there how you see storage, because you know, there's a huge growth in data. There is. Um, so talk about how you see that world. The, 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 the physical part or the no, stuff? The, 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 the storing bits, just a very simple <clears throat> equation. You got to store bits and you got to protect bits. Right, well, so, that, so that's it. So we try and let our clients determine what fundamental hardware to put the bits on, right? Because at the end of the day, bits, bits are bits, right? And, and customers tend to have a hard time getting rid of the bits. Yeah, yeah we don't ever get rid of anything. Well, and, and there's, there's good reasons and there's, you know, not so good reasons. One, you know, an excuse. Uh, I got a compliance audit coming up, right? I'm, you know, I got HIPAA regulations or I got Basil or Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, but, you know, the reality is you can <clears throat> implement technologies that exist already today and have been for many years to get rid of some of those bits. You can. You can get rid of the duplicate bits. You can actually compress the size of the bits. Or you could take the really, really hard step from an organizational perspective and have that discussion with all the line of business executives as to whose applications that are creating all these bits Whose is the most important? Now that's going to create a fight, right? But at the end of the day, you can decide your application generates the most revenue, it's the most strategic, it's the most client-centric, whatever the case may be. You get top priority, you get second priority, third priority, fourth priority, and then you can actually move those bits around to say application number one, business owner number one, your response time to your clients, your end user, is one-tenth of a millisecond. And application owner number five may not be one-tenth of a millisecond, it may be one millisecond. At the end of the day, you can actually make movement of those bits between the real-time storage and the long-term preservation of those bits and save a lot of money. Yeah, and you can align that as well with an IT as a service. Right? Exactly service right. Well, so interesting, right? So you, IT as a service, both from a private perspective and a public perspective, right? And I, I will contend over time, and time by the way is not many, many years, that every IT infrastructure will be a hybrid, a hybrid cloud. You know, it's funny. Can I call you Woj? That's, I, so I prefer it's funny you, you say that because uh, we did a survey exactly a year ago today and we asked the practitioners in the Wikibon community, you know, what, what's your primary cloud strategy? And yeah. only about less than 10%, less than about 9% said that hybrid cloud was a primary strategy. We just did the survey again last week, we finished it, 
It was like 39 percent. Yeah. So this is, and it was by far the largest strategy. Well, yeah. A dwarfed public right. cloud is the promise. Right. And, and so and I, and I will, you're seeing I, that yeah. needle really. And really I will really. contend the other 61 percent just haven't realized it yet. Yeah, they don't know it. Right. right. Yeah. So I mean, and it's not, you know, it's, uh, it's not to say that you're going to be 50 percent private, 50 percent public. It's going to come down to the economics of what is my most critical. How can I, you know, how do I pay for it? Who can provide me the service? Who is a partner that can allow me to get an SLA that I can live with based on the dollars and cents per bit, per application, per business to support it? So it might be 90% private today and 10% public. Over time, it'll probably grow to 20, 80. And you know, for, for very, very small customers, it might be 99 to 90 to one, 90 to 10. Sure. You know, it might be 90% public, 10% private. I mean, if the economics are there, and a customer can feel can feel comfortable about the vendor they're getting their private service from, or their public service from, why not? So, that's a big trend you've identified. Uh, how do you respond to that? What's IBM doing to capitalize on that trend? Well, we know, so we're embracing it, right? So we know customers are going to go there, and so being able to allow them to uh, interact and manage between their private and their public infrastructures, allow them through standards, through open interfaces, through ways to manage their, their physicalness of their devices with the virtualness of a, of, a, of a public cloud, be able to move the data back and forth and be able to create dashboards so that they can look at their infrastructure. And you notice I didn't say private infrastructure. The infrastructure to support their business process and their applications independent of where it resides. So allow a customer to manage their SLAs, drive the, the need of their business from an application and, a, and you know, the, the end result that they want, which is to drive their business, client satisfaction, and look at it and measure it and allow them to, to, to bounce it back and forth. Doesn't it make your job a lot easier if that whole environment is, is homogeneous? Absolutely and, does. But the, but the environment is not homogeneous. Is, yeah, but the reality is, yeah. So yeah. how do you deal with it? Exactly, well, you know, and you know, it would make my life a lot easier too if I had a tree in the backyard that grew money. But that's not the reality of it all, right? The reality you is... You gotta get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have one of those? <laughs> no, that's my next project. <laughs> uh, but, so the reality is, you know, customers want choice, they want flexibility, they want to avoid vendor lock-in, right? But they, I, I'm one vendor of many, I'm one partner of many to my clients. And they know, they can come to me, I will give them a roadmap. They will explain to me what they like about my roadmap and what they don't like about my roadmap. And my job is to change what I don't like about my roadmap to satisfy what they want. And they don't want me to highly optimize to a single hardware platform, to a single operating system, to a single stack, to a single you know, storage type. What right? specific trends are you seeing on the software side that's in that layer? You mentioned um, you're building this layer to abstract away. So yep. the multi-vendor can exist, right. which is a requirement. Right. What, what, what trends and innovations going on at the software layer that you can share? Sure, so when I think of trends, I think of Two, I think of it from two different angles. One is from a client perspective. And so from a client perspective, clients are finally getting comfortable with implementing software capabilities outside of the, the fundamental hardware base that have been around for a long time. So think about you know, thin provisioning, think about tiering, think about deduplication on, on backup and protection. So you're think saying there were silos before. <clears throat> there were silos before, but I think they were very, so, Many, you know, we all know that operation centers are very risk adverse, right? It's working today. Anything I do different could introduce risk. My job is to not introduce risk. My job is to do my job as I know it today. Yeah. And so we've, we've got to, you know, it takes a long time to be a change agent to get them to implement things and, and prove to them that it works. Now, from a, from, a, from a technology perspective, virtualization of storage is ramping up much faster than the server side did. So customers, as we all know, are very comfortable with server side, compute side virtualization, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the same aspects, the same value attributes, the same concepts can be used on the storage itself. And so allowing an application to inter interface with an abstraction layer to allow you to manage, virtualize, and protect the fundamental underlying bits, as I talked about the information, the ones and zeros on the disks, to that application is where they're all going, independent of the hardware underneath it. And then being able to take that information and create you know, disaster recovery sites, create replicated versions of it, be able to do hot stand, standby or failovers in, a, you know, in real, real time. 
from a technology perspective, being able to stay one or two steps ahead of clients and their willingness to implement the technology. Because they're always, they're always lagging. Now, they always ask for, what are you doing about capability A? And that's because they read about it in some trade magazine or a competitive website and you know, they're really, it's really interesting and sexy and you know, what's it all about? What are you doing about that? Well, yeah, we're implementing that, so tell me again, you know, when is your plan to implement that? Well, I'd have no plan or it's in my roadmap or whatever, right? So my job is to make sure that I'm one step ahead and to teach them, implement, it'll drive efficiency, it'll drive optimization, and it'll help you down the road to whatever your business objective We've is. been hearing a lot from uh, customers and in, in, uh, the practitioners in the Wikibon community about automation. Yeah. Automation is a big concept in DevOps or ops in general. Yes. I mean, you mentioned ops. <laughs> ops are very much, you know, there's no downtime required, but right. DevOps is an interesting yep. new cultural yep. breed of yep. client. Yeah, and so DevOps, from so interesting, DevOps, if you think about DevOps from a storage perspective, you do a little bit of development, but it's not really the compute side of the development where you got to kind of test it out and run it and put an application on it and understand the performance attributes and understand the I.O. and think all across the entire system. From a DevOps point of view, think about being able to manage your, for example, in storage, be able to do, okay, what if I wanted to insert this new disk from vendor B and move my workload from this volume to that volume, prototype it for me, click. Oh. My performance on this side went up or down by X percent, right? You can then take a, a really rational thought process and say, hmm, it's worth it for me to buy that. It's worth it for me to move this, or it's not, because you know my performance just went down by X amount of percent and my SLA just got blown. Maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I do some other workload. So inside of the management stack that we have, you can do that. You can so you can do, enable that, what you just said. You can do proactive testing in the environment that exists today without implementing Losing. it in the existing environment. How does that happen? What product is that? So there's, there's a couple of specific Cause, cause products. Because that's been demand right now. A lot of yeah. people want that product. So, so there's, a, there's a thing that we're in, we announced today on a statement of direction called the Smart Cloud Virtual Storage Center. It incorporates the IBM management stack around Tivoli Productivity Center, the virtualization capabilities around SAN volume controller, and it includes capabilities around copy. So IBM uh, has this flash copy and inside of this suite also has flash copy managers. So Snapshot. Snapshots within the IBM framework of, of storage devices. So think about being able to include management of the entire infrastructure, not IBM disks, not you know, the competitor's yeah. disks. One window. One, one window, one place for the application to come in, one management stack, one virtualization stack, that virtualization, virtualization stack implements all of the specific code to run, you, know, you pick your vendor of choice on the storage side, and then it implements the ability to do flash copy management, snapshots, across yeah. those systems. It's interesting, Dave, you know, we, we this apples and oranges here. EMC has 42 product announcements at EMC World two weeks ago. IBM doesn't have a lot of product announcements, but there's a lot of integration. Ton. So, so there's two different cultures there. Yeah. So, so Dave, I'd like you, what's your take on that? I mean, well, you're you're right on, and and well, we heard you know EMC's approach is to try to create a, a product that's a, a mashup. Yeah. Um, now, my question to you is, you, you're clearly delivering what customers are saying to us that they want. Yeah. You know, we're, not, we're so sick of managers of managers of managers. Yes. At the same time, it's not trivial to put all not that all. function in there because it makes the environment more complicated, more complicated to deploy. That's right. You, you, you know, so That's right. how is That's right. Tivoli Productivity Center dealing with that complexity? Can you do both? Well, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. So it takes a tremendous amount of effort. So let me just, let me just give you an example of kind of the, the process and method we went through for Tivoli Productivity Center 5.1 that is GAing this month. Mm -hmm. It's been in development from a GUI and ease of use point of view for 18 months. We've had clients working with early prototypes, screenshots, architectural diagrams, user groups, focus groups, uh, customer advisory and business partner advisory councils, all looking at how do you make this new user interface and it looks, you know, the icons look exactly like XIV and Storewise, structured on the panels the exact same way. Very, 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 very strict architectural principles. No more than, you know, six icons on the left and no more than three layers deep and no more than, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Really disciplined approach. Very disciplined. Now, I will tell you, that made it very hard from a development point of view to live within those architectural disciplines. However, that's part of the brilliance of it. 
right? You're able that the customers don't have this jet dashboard where it's got 50,000 knobs and 2,500 lights and switches and a controller, right? They can do a certain number of things. And what we found is that with this very simple approach, the day-to-day -day management of the storage infrastructure from an operations point of view, not, not the initial of let's roll in a disk and let's get it set up and let's, that's very complex. And that was all part of the base product to begin with. What you can see now is, is that when you use Tivoli Productivity Center with SAN volume controller and flash copy, you can, 80% of the day-to-day -day tasks that a storage operations person would do every day can be done in a very small number of panels. And so being able to deliver that in a way that's very appealing to the eye, has intuitive flow throughout the system, and can do it across heterogeneous environments drives a tremendous amount of value. Now, storage infrastructures are going to stay complex, right? Especially when you throw in networking and what, what virtual servers are connecting to and virtual you know, storage devices and all these kinds of things. I thought virtualization made it all invisible. Well, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. To everyone except yeah. the operators that have to manage it. Sack. I <laughs> love the DevOps angle. I think that was really compelling. That's really yeah. a hot area. Thanks for sharing with that. Sure. Uh, I know we were getting pressed for time. Okay. My final question, and Dave can get, get a question in, is what's changing in, in the software going forward? So you made some announcements today. Obviously the theme is integration, yes. cross-functional capabilities within yes. IBM. Yes. Bring those solutions to customers that actually deliver from day one, um, great message. What's next in software? With the, um, the horizon of the tsunami of data, big data yes. in particular, yes. analytics building on yes. top of that, yes. more need for manageability, yes. data's and, not and, going away. And automation. Yeah. Automation. So, so it's all those things put together. So think about, I'll, I'll, let me just come right back to where we started, which is around the information life cycle. So information's created all over the place. Everybody's application creates tons and tons of data and it's not going away unless we make some changes technology point of view and a process point of view. So being able to take that information, move it across the storage infrastructure, use many, many different types of storage devices to capture that information, and understand where it's hot, where it's not, move the hot close to the application for performance reasons, the not, figure out whether you want to get rid of it, and if you want, don't want to get rid of it and you want to keep it and protect it for a long term, yeah. do you want to keep it for 30 days, do you want to keep it for three years, do you want to keep it for 10 years? And move that information from hot, immediate, now stored on SSD, to long-term data protection, one, 10, 25 copies, out to a archived tape rule, and be able to integrate all that together into a, into a system that allows a client to understand this information is important for today, this information yeah. could be important for tomorrow, and then put it into your system. So, actually my final, final question is uh, more of a culture one. Uh, every company has a nuance like about them, like they ship early, they, you know, they, they, they're they maniacal about a certain yes. approach. What is the storage engineering team, what's yep. that one thing that makes them different and better than? than let me uh, let me give it, so you asked the final, final, like a good, uh, you know, uh, Congress, you know, okay, <laughs> one more final, one more final. <laughs> I'll give you a two-part answer. One is, I was not in that picture, I swear to God. Yeah. <laughs> one is, one is, I will not ship a software product until it's ready. And what I mean by that is client, client interaction, client feedback, change it. More client feedback, change it. More client feedback, change it. When I think it's about ready to go, I ask one more time. The what, final, final question. Final, final question. <laughs> now, I'm going to do all of that to where I am convinced that the client, from a broad market perspective, can use it, it's valuable to them, and they're willing to pay, so, so you, and so, quality. So shipping code, product, that meets the customer's requirements as defined by you guys in Bulletproof. As, as defined by the client that I implement, Yes. and I'm going to do it in a quality way. Okay. All right. Whoa, Jay, thanks very much for coming on Appreciate the Appreciate it, thank you very much, job. it was fun. And, uh, VP of uh, development, he builds the products, he's the man behind the curtain, making the trains, building the train tracks and the train uh, IBM. Uh, great, great commentary, appreciate it. Software is the key to success in this future uh, hardware business, and, uh, and we hear that all in all, so appreciate that. We'll be right back with theCUBE right after this short break. Thank you.